for when I joined the SNP as a 16-year-old. Uh, we will all miss her uh, hugely. And in paying tribute to her today, I want to send my love and condolences to her husband, Grady, and to her children, John and Shelley, and to her beloved grandchildren. You really were the light of her life. Your granny was a very special person, and she was extremely proud of all of you. Presiding officer, let me turn now to uh, my statement. And firstly, can I thank you for this recall of parliament today and join you in wishing everyone all the very best for a new year that we hope, despite its very difficult start, will bring better times. The cabinet met this morning to assess the up-to-date COVID situation, which I must say at the outset is extremely serious. And to discuss what further action is necessary to minimise further spread of the virus. I will set out the decisions we reached shortly. However, I can confirm now in summary that we have decided to introduce from midnight tonight for the duration of January a legal requirement to stay at home except for essential purposes. This is similar to the lockdown of March last year. However, before I set out these decisions in more detail, I want to take uh, the opportunity to explain in some detail why they are so necessary. In the past few weeks, there have been two significant game changers in our fight against this virus. One, the approval of vaccines is hugely positive and it does offer us the way out of this pandemic. But the other, the new faster spreading variant of the virus is a massive blow. And possibly the most simple way of explaining the challenge we face right now is to compare it to a race. In one lane, we have vaccines, and our job is to make sure they can run as fast as possible. And that's why the government will be doing everything we can to vaccinate people as quickly as possible. And I will say more about that later. But in the other lane is the virus, which as a result of this new variant has just learned to run much faster and has most definitely picked up pace in the past couple of weeks. To ensure that the vaccine wins this race, it is essential to speed up vaccination as far as possible, but to give it the time it needs to get ahead, we must also slow the virus down. And because it is now spreading faster, that means even tougher restrictions are necessary. The evidence, presiding officer, is now compelling that the new variant is up to 70% more transmissible than previously circulating strains, and that it may add as much as 0.7 to the R number. And according to recent analysis of PCR test samples, it appears that the new variant already accounts for almost half of all new cases in Scotland. That increased uh, and faster spread is undoubtedly driving the very serious situation we now face. Today's case numbers, uh, 1,905 new cases, uh, with 15% of tests uh, being positive, illustrate the severity and the urgency of the situation. No new deaths were reported today, but that is because yesterday was a Sunday and registration offices were largely closed. But since I updated Parliament before Christmas, 289 deaths have been recorded in our daily figures. That again reminds us of the continuing grief that this pandemic is causing. But let me stress, this is not just about one single day's numbers we are now seeing a steeply rising trend of infections. Indeed, it is no exaggeration to say that I am more concerned about the situation we face now than I have been at any time since March last year. In the week from the 23rd to the 30th of December, the seven-day incidence of cases per 100,000 of the population increased by 65%, uh, from 136 per 100,000 to 225 per 100,000. Test positivity has risen sharply too. The next update on the numbers of COVID patients in hospital and intensive care will be published tomorrow. I would expect these to show that nationally, the total number of COVID patients in hospital is now close to the April peak. And in some boards, the pressure is already very real. For example, in terms of hospital beds, NHS Ayrshire and Arran is currently at 96% of its COVID capacity. And three other health boards, Borders, Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Lanarkshire are above 60% of their capacity. 
The number of people in intensive care is still significantly lower than the April peak, which of course partly reflects the fact that treatment of COVID has improved significantly since last spring. But even so, the total number of patients in intensive care in Scotland is already above normal winter levels. Indeed, all mainland health boards have now exceeded their normal intensive care unit capacity. And it is important to be clear, and, and this is a key point, that people who are in hospital and intensive care now are likely to have been infected 10 days to two weeks ago. That means that these numbers reflect what the level of new cases was around two weeks ago. And given that the number of cases has increased significantly since then, that means we can expect to see significantly increased pressure on the NHS over the course of this month. Now, contingency plans remain in place to double and then treble ICU capacity if necessary, and the NHS Louisa Jordan continues to be available to help meet demand, as indeed it has been doing in recent months. 12,000 patients have attended there for scans and outpatient appointments. Nearly 5,000 NHS staff and students have been trained there, and it is currently being used for COVID vaccinations. In short, NHS services are coping at present, although the pressure on frontline staff is considerable. But already in some areas, the position is fragile and it is getting more challenging. And if the rate of increase in case numbers that we have seen in the past two weeks was to continue unchecked, there would be a real risk of our NHS being overwhelmed, even with contingency plans in place. In fact, our modelling suggests that without further intervention, we could breach inpatient COVID capacity within three or four weeks. And of course, a sharply increasing number of cases in human terms means many more people becoming ill and dying. All of that explains why we have to act quickly and decisively. The situation in some other parts of the UK where case numbers are already much higher than here and where the contribution of the new variant is already greater shows what may lie ahead if we don't. As things stand, we estimate that we are possibly about four weeks behind the position in London and the southeast of England. The rapid acceleration in London began when it was at about 160 new cases a week per 100,000 people. That's the level Scotland was at a week ago. London is now seeing 900 new cases a week per 100,000. Their test positivity is around 27% and pressure on NHS services is acute. We have an opportunity in Scotland to avert the situation here deteriorating to that extent, but we must act quickly. The advice of our clinical advisers is clear that the increased transmissibility of the new variant means that the current level four measures may not be sufficient to bring the R number back below one. It is essential, therefore, that we further limit interaction between different households to stem the spread and bring the situation back under control while we vaccinate more people. In short, we must return for a period to a situation much closer to the lockdown of last March. Let me, therefore, set out in more detail the decisions that the Cabinet reached this morning. It is important to stress that these are not decisions that we took lightly. I am acutely aware of the impact they will have, and I know they will not be welcome, but they are, in our judgment, essential. As government, our clear and overriding duty right now is to act quickly to save lives and protect the NHS. We know that delay or prevarication in the face of this virus almost always makes things worse, not better, even if it stems from an understandable desire that we all share to wait for more data or evidence. Now, the, to turn to the decisions in, in detail, the decisions I will speak about a bit later on schools, let me be clear at this uh, stage, presiding officer, that they will apply to all parts of Scotland. However, the decisions, uh, other decisions I'm about to outline uh, will apply to those parts of Scotland currently in level four, which of course is all of mainland Scotland, uh, and they are effectively an enhancement to level four. The island areas currently in level three will remain there for now, although we will continue to monitor them very carefully. These additional level four restrictions, essentially returning us to a position similar to the lockdown of last March, will be in place for the whole of January. We will keep them closely under review. However, I can't at this stage rule out having to keep them in place longer, nor rule out making further changes. Nothing about the current situation is easy. The first measure is that our fundamental advice for everyone is to stay at home. That is the single best way of staying uh, safe. 
Uh, we consider that this stay-at-home message uh, and advice is now so important that from uh, tomorrow uh, it will become law just as it was in the lockdown last year. This means it will only be permissible to leave home for an essential purpose. This will include, for example, caring responsibilities, essential shopping, exercise and being part of an extended household. In addition, anyone who is able to work from home must do so. It will only be a reasonable excuse to leave your home to go to work if that work cannot be done from home. We are asking people and businesses to take this really seriously, just as seriously as we all did in March during the first lockdown, because the situation now is at least as serious as it was then. The law already requires many businesses in certain sectors to close in level four. We now need every business to look again at their operations and to make sure that every single function that can be done by people working at home is being done in that way. Businesses have already shown a tremendous capacity to adapt during this pandemic, and I'm very grateful to them for that. Uh, but we need them to consider their operations again as we all work together to reduce transmissions. The Economy Secretary will be speaking to business organisations about this, including uh, later this afternoon, and we will engage with trade unions on these issues too, and we will continue to consider if more regulatory action is required. We're also providing uh, today new guidance to people who are in the shielding category. If you were shielding and you cannot work from home, our clear advice now is that you should not go into work at all. The Chief Medical Officer is writing to everyone who falls into this category and his letter will count as a fit note for those who need it. Under the lockdown last year, the frequency, unlike the lockdown last year, the frequency of outdoor exercise is not being limited. It is important for physical and mental health that we can get outdoors for fresh air and exercise as much as possible. However, from tomorrow, the rule on outdoor gatherings will change. As of now, up to six people from two households are able to meet outdoors. Given the greater transmissibility of this new variant, we consider it necessary to restrict that further. From tomorrow, a maximum of two people from up to two households will be able to meet outdoors. Children aged 11 and under will not be counted in that limit, and they will also be able to play outdoors in larger groups, including in organised gatherings. However, for everyone else, including 12 to 17-year-olds, outdoor exercise should only take place in a way that is consistent with the two people from two households rule. In addition, strict travel restrictions remain in place across Scotland. From tomorrow, if you live in a level four area, as the majority of us do, you cannot leave home except for an essential purpose. When you do go out, stay as close to home as possible and stay away from crowded places. And it remains the case, and let me stress this point, that no one is allowed to travel into or out of Scotland unless it is for an essential purpose. Setting officer, a number of other measures will come into effect on Friday of this week. It is with real regret that we consider it necessary for places of worship to close during this period for all purposes except broadcasting a service or conducting a funeral, uh, wedding or civil partnership. Uh, I'm well aware of how important communal worship is to people, but we believe this restriction is necessary to reduce the risk of transmission. While up to 20 people will still be able to attend funeral services, wakes will not be possible during January, and a maximum of five people will be able to attend wedding and civil partnership services. Signing officer, I know how devastating restrictions like these ones are, and I give an assurance that we will not keep them in place for any longer than is absolutely necessary. There will also be additional measures in relation to businesses, in addition to the tightening of the essential retail definition that took effect from Boxing Day. The current one metre exemption for workplace canteens will end, so canteens will have to ensure that employees sit two metres or more apart rather than one metre. The number of non-essential services which remain open will be further restricted. Premises which will need to close as a result of these changes will include, for example, ski centres, showrooms of larger retailers and clinics offering cosmetic and aesthetic procedures. I know that many businesses have already been hit by the restrictions which were put in place on Boxing Day. And of course, I know that the vast majority of businesses have taken their responsibility seriously and invested in COVID safety measures. In addition, the move to home working has brought challenges for workers and employers. I'm hugely grateful for the way in which businesses and their staff have responded to those challenges. 
Grants are, of course, available for businesses required to close as a result of restrictions. That support is an addition to support through the UK-wide furlough scheme. The Scottish Government's financial support for businesses during the pandemic currently totals more than £2.3 billion, but we will continue to assess what more we can do, either in closure grants or other forms of support, to help businesses and those who work for them. We will also be working with councils to ensure community and social support for those who need it, including for parents balancing work and online learning. We will confirm additional resources for these purposes later this week. Presiding officer, the final substantive issue I want to address before giving an update on vaccination relates to schools. We announced before Christmas that most school pupils would learn remotely rather than in school until Monday 18th January. I can confirm that we have now decided to extend that date and keep schools closed to the majority of pupils until the 1st of February. We will review this again in mid-January. The change will apply to all pupils except vulnerable children and children of key workers, and it includes nursery schools as well as primary and secondary schools. Uh, there's no doubt at all that of all the difficult decisions we have had to take today, this was the most difficult of all and its impact is, of course, uh, the most severe. The evidence to date makes clear that thanks to the hard work of school staff and pupils, schools in Scotland have been low-risk environments for COVID. We will work with partners to ensure that can remain the case. That will include ongoing work on testing in schools and discussions about when, in the context of the overall programme, it will be possible to vaccinate school staff. And I want to be clear that it remains our priority to get school buildings open again for all pupils as quickly as possible and then keep them open. But right now, two factors mean that it is not consistent with a safety first approach for all children to attend school in person. First, the overall level of community transmission is simply too high. We need to get transmission down before schools can safely reopen. A period of online learning will also in turn help us to do that. The second reason is that there is still significant uncertainty about the impact of the new variant on transmission amongst young people. We therefore have to adopt a cautious approach at this stage, and that's why most pupils will be learning online for at least the rest of the month. We will review on 18th January whether they can, as we hope, return to school on the 1st of February. I know that remote learning presents significant challenges for teachers, schools, parents and young people, and we will work to support children and parents throughout this. The Government, Education Scotland and local authorities are working together to further improve the remote learning options available for schools. And it's also worth highlighting that since schools returned after the summer, more than 50,000 devices such as laptops have been distributed to children and young people to help with remote learning. More devices are being distributed by councils on a weekly basis and in total we expect our investment which builds on existing local authority action to benefit around 70,000 disadvantaged children and young people across the country. I also want to stress one final point. Just as the last places we ever want to close are schools and nurseries, so it is the case that schools and nurseries will be the first places we want to reopen as we re-emerge from this latest period of lockdown. They remain our priority. That is why we are considering whether and to what extent, consistent with our overall duty to vaccinate the most vulnerable first in line with JCVI recommendations, we can achieve vaccination of school and childcare staff as a priority. Uh, let me point out, though, that many teachers will, of course, be vaccinated over coming weeks as part of the JCVI priority list. The fortnightly review will not simply be a choice between opening and closing schools. We will always seek to maximise the number of pupils we can safely get back to classrooms and nurseries. So if the evidence tells us we can get some pupils back safely, that is what we will do. However, ultimately, the best way of enabling more pupils to return more quickly is by reducing community transmission of the virus as much as possible. And all of us, by accepting and abiding by the wider restrictions I have set out today, have a part to play in achieving that. Uh, before I leave the issue of education, let me simply remind the Chamber that we already had plans in place for the staggered return of universities and colleges. We will be considering this week whether any further change to that plan is necessary. Presiding officer, before I close today, I want to give a brief update on our current exp expectations around vaccine supply. The Health Secretary will give a more detailed update on vaccination in a statement to the Chamber next week. However, I can confirm today that well over 100,000 people have now received their first dose of vaccine. The first doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine are being administered in Scotland today. 
in total over the period to the end of January, including the more than 100,000 already administered, we expect to have access to just over 900,000 doses of vaccine, although obviously we hope that number will increase. Uh, these will be split roughly equally between the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines. However, we anticipate that some of the AstraZeneca portion will be available only in the last week of January. We don't yet have certainty on supply schedules beyond January, but we will keep Parliament updated as these become firmer. However, our current expectation, based on assumptions about supply and also on the new advice on doses being administered up to 12 weeks apart rather than three, is that by early May, everyone over 50 and people under 50 with specific underlying conditions will have received at least the first dose of vaccine. And that is everyone who is on the JCVI priority list and comprises more than two and a half million people. Once everyone on the priority list has been vaccinated, we will start uh, vaccinating the rest of the population and we will do this in parallel with completing second doses for those on the priority list. Uh, those timetables are, of course, heavily dependent on supply and for that reason they are at this stage cautious. However, I have tasked our vaccination team with exploring and keeping under ongoing review all possible options to speed up the rate of vaccination and bring these timescales forward as far as we possibly can. I'm grateful for the many offers of assistance we have received and while many of them may not prove possible or practical to take up, they will all be considered. And as I said, the Health Secretary will say more about all of this in her statement next week. Presiding officer, to conclude, this is most certainly not the New Year's statement I wanted to give, and I know it is a statement no one wanted to hear. But as I said at the beginning, we are now in a race between the vaccine and the virus. The Scottish Government will do everything we can to speed up distribution of the vaccine. But all of us must do everything we can to slow down the spread of the virus. We can already see by looking at infection rates elsewhere uh, some of what could happen here in Scotland if we don't act. To prevent that, we must act immediately and firmly. For government, that means introducing tough measures as we have done so today. And for all of us, it means sticking to the rules. It means continuing to follow the facts guidance. And it means, above all, staying at home. That is, again, our central message. Stay home, save lives, protect the NHS. If we do this, we give the vaccine the time it needs to get ahead and ultimately win this race. I know that the next few weeks will be incredibly difficult. I'm sorry to ask for further sacrifices after nine long months of them, but these sacrifices are necessary. And the difference between now and last March is that with the help of vaccines, we now have confidence that these sacrifices will pave the way to brighter days ahead. So for everyone's sake and for everyone's safety, please stick with it and stay at home. Thank you very much, First Minister. First Minister will now take questions, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. First of all, Presiding Officer, may I offer the condolences of myself and of my party on the news of the passing of Kate Ulrich, who was respected across this chamber. Uh, and I too am grateful to you, Presiding Officer, for recalling Parliament for today's statement. Nobody wants to live under restrictions for a moment longer than is absolutely necessary, or for those restrictions to be any tighter than needed. However, the increase in infection rate and the transmissibility of the new variant gives grave cause for concern. We have come too far to throw all our efforts away, and the rollout of the vaccine means that we can see a time soon when all this will begin to be over. That being said, this is hard news at a hard time when the resilience of people across the country has already been worn down over the past year. Many will be dismayed by today's news, not least the parents of school pupils, who now have to rip up their childcare plans, negotiate with their employers, and worry about their children's fractured education. The Children's and Young People's Commissioner has expressed concerns that closing schools poses a serious risk of harm to the well-being of children and young people. And he's also warned that support for online learning is being provided inconsistently across Scotland and that there's not enough national guidance and support for schools from government ministers threatening a further widening of the attainment gap. So can I ask what further steps the Scottish Government is taking now to address these concerns and to ensure that Scottish pupils continue to get equal access to high quality education? First Minister. Well, can I firstly agree that this will be very hard uh, news for everybody across Scotland to hear today and to contemplate the reality of over these next few weeks. I want to 
reiterate uh, to people again that these are decisions that we do not take lightly. Uh, we agonise over them um, and uh, we only uh, announce restrictions like this if we really feel there is no alternative. And right now, the only alternative is greater loss of life and the potential for our National Health Service to be overwhelmed. Um, and speed of action at this point in time is the most important factor of all. The decision we most agonised over was uh, the further closure of schools for the majority of pupils. Uh, the issue of schools closed or open has been contentious in the most recent weeks and teachers and others have understandably uh, raised concerns but I hope people see uh, from the responses of the government and the actions of the government that we have uh, striven and will continue to strive to keep schools open uh, as normally as possible, uh, as often and as for as long as possible. Um, and this decision today is one that we deem necessary for the reasons I set out. Uh, we will, and the Education Secretary will set out uh, for MSPs, uh, I'll, uh, ensure that this happens uh, over the uh, next couple of days, uh, the steps that are being taken to ensure that the provision of online education is as parents want it to be and that local authorities are working to ensure that that is of a consistent quality across the country. We have already taken steps, as I indicated in my opening uh, remarks, to ensure that more young people have access to uh, digital devices to make online uh, learning more accessible to them. Uh, schools uh, and local authorities already have contingency plans in place. There is advice for parents available via uh, the Parent Club website. Parents can also speak direct to schools uh, for more advice. Uh, the national online learning platform, GLOW, uh, has seen a huge increase in users and usage uh, since earlier last year, and we are working actively with local and national partners to enhance the online and remote learning options uh, for pupils. Um, that's work that will continue over the course of next week and for as long as is necessary. But let me end uh, this answer with uh, a reiteration of the point that we want this to be for as short a period as necessary for all of the reasons that I think everybody understands and agrees with. Ruth Davison. Today's announcement underscores the need to have a comprehensive test and trace system in place. In August, the First Minister promised that between UK Government Lighthouse Labs and NHS Scotland facilities that we would have the capacity for 65,000 tests per day. However, the highest number of tests carried out in a single day was 30,619 on Christmas Day, with currently a third of tests carried out by NHS Scotland and the majority by the Lighthouse Labs. She also promised that three regional hubs for testing would be open by the end of December, but so far only two have done so. The test positivity rate over the last seven days is now the highest it has ever been since the Scottish Government started publishing this data in August. So can I ask the First Minister, is there capacity in Scotland to carry out 65,000 tests per day? And if there is, why are the actual tests carried out on any day well below half of that capacity? And when will the Edinburgh Regional Hub be open for testing? First Minister. Um, yes, there is capacity for 65,000 tests a day. Uh, that uh, target that we set earlier in the year was met uh, by Christmas. Uh, the number of tests, though, that are actually carried out on any given day is largely demand-driven because it is people who have symptoms coming forward for testing. And we have seen, and I think we will continue to see, that number rise as, uh, unfortunately, this faster spreading strain of the virus infects more people. But the capacity um, and the demand for testing will often not be uh, numbers that are exactly the same for, for obvious uh, reasons. Of course, we do uh, increasingly, although uh, some of the uh, asymptomatic testing is not done through the PCR testing uh, that goes through the, the laboratory network, uh, some of that is now done by lateral flow testing, uh, which don't appear in these numbers. Uh, but some asymptomatic testing uh, is done in this way. Care home staff, for example, which we are in the process, well uh, through the process of transferring from the Lighthouse Lab network uh, to the NHS Scotland uh, lab network. Uh, we do have a, a well-functioning test uh, and protect system uh, and it continues to be a really important part of our response uh, to this virus. But as we uh, have a, a virus that is spreading faster, uh, then we have to uh, have a, a range of different responses to that uh, in order to complement the test and protect. And of course, in terms of interventions, just as test and protect has been important, uh, the vaccine programme becomes increasingly important over the next period. And lastly, uh, there has been a, a last minute issue or pro probably not literally last minute, but la late stage issue in the Edinburgh uh, la regional lab with a sprinkler system, as I understand it, which is in the process of being rectified. And that is due to open shortly. Mr. Davison. 
Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister there, addressing the recalled Scottish Parliament on what she has described as an extremely serious situation. More concerned now about the situation, she said, than I have been at any time since March last year. And so she is introducing from midnight tonight for the duration of January a national lockdown for Scotland. It will be a legal requirement to stay at home except for essential purposes. And those Essential purposes mean it is only permissible to leave home for essential shopping, for caring responsibilities, for exercise, if you're part of an extended household or for work and only if that work can't be done from home. She said every business needs to look again at operations and ensure that every function that can be done at home is done at home. On the subject of schools, uh, they will be closed for the majority of pupils now until the 1st of February. And in terms of uh, the lockdown restrictions, uh, they will last until the end of January, but she said she cannot rule out having to extend them further. Let's bring in our Scotland correspondent, James Matthews, who is in Edinburgh uh, for us. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, talking about the increasingly serious situation in Scotland and why she has had to take these measures. So it's going to look like it did back in March, James. Yeah, it's going to be broadly similar, Sarah. Uh, from midnight tonight, there will be this legally enforceable stay-at-home message. And as you said, uh, people will only be allowed out for essential reasons, essential shopping to procure medicines and so on, exercise. No limit on exercise, incidentally. You'll remember there was the one-hour outing restriction uh, last March. Um, she said that it was uh, all to do with this race, as she characterised it, between the vaccine and the virus. The virus had picked up speed because of this new strain, which she said uh, evidence increasingly showed that it was 70% more transmissible, that it could raise the R number by uh, 0.7. So she said there was an urgency uh, to act now to, to balance the race between progress on the vaccine and to slow down, as she put it, the spread of this virus. She reeled off a number of figures, one of which was the kind of hospital bed occupancy for COVID patients in a number of health board areas. Ayrshire and Arran, she said, was up to 96%. There was a few others uh, who were above 60% of capacity. She said that things weren't as bad here in terms of COVID infections as they are in London, but she reckoned that Scotland was something like three, four weeks behind London, and she said that if actions that she was taken were not taken now, then Scotland would, would soon catch up, which I suppose has implications for judgments being made in Downing Street as to whether or not they opt for a lockdown, seeing that Scotland uh, views the situation three weeks before as necessitating uh, a Scottish lockdown. So perhaps the judgment of Holyrood goes into the mix uh, 400 miles south. But in terms of Scotland, yeah, we're pretty much uh, back to where we were in March for the duration of January. And she didn't rule out, Nicola Sturgeon, didn't rule out any further changes. There will be fortnightly reviews of where we are and, um, you know, decisions will be taken accordingly. On education, that was one of the main decisions she announced today, um, and that was a change. The plan had been to send youngsters back to face-to-face -face learning on the 18th of January. That's been shifted back for secondary, primary and nursery to the 1st of February. It will be online uh, learning between now and then. James there in Edinburgh for us. Thanks very much indeed. James there uh, talking about whether or not this increases the pressure on Boris Johnson, what this means uh, for the Westminster government, our political correspondent.